Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Carrie Canoe from the Student Life Office of Ivy Tech Fort Wayne. And today, um, leading our event today is uh, Mr. Chris Douse. He is our Director of Retention and Engagement here at Ivy Tech Fort Wayne. Um, and he is gonna go ahead and introduce our topic and what we'll be talking about today and our panelists. Go ahead, Chris. Cool, good afternoon. Thank you, Carrie. Um, today we're going to be talking about the experiences of black males in higher education and we've put together an exciting panel of some 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 guys that I know who work um, some work in higher education some are entrepreneurs and some also work in the social service field and so hopefully we'll have an awesome hour of discussion please raise your hand um, and ask questions at any time um, but I have a series of questions we'll talk and um, discuss and, and hopefully we'll all learn some new things um, as the program goes along. So I'm going to start with the panelists and have you introduce yourself um, and speak briefly about how did you get into higher education as far as your schooling? What was your pathway into higher education um, and what that, that experience is like? So let's start off with um, going across. We'll start off with Khalid um, Griffin. He is a professor um, at Trine. So Khalid. Yeah, uh, first of all, good afternoon to each of you. Um, professor Griffin at Trine University, Frank School of Education. Uh, my route here was interesting and I know we have to be brief, but uh, long story short, um, started at K through 12 actually, was a teacher at Southside for a few years. And then I transitioned into administration I uh, did five years of administration and I was approached last, um, around this time last year, hey, um, this is a great opportunity for a growing program for you to impart into future educators. I got two young children, I run a church and not, not for profit and the administrator schedule was just hectic. So uh, long story short, um, it worked out. It was like a hundred applicants for this position. And with my experience as a teacher and a, an, an administrator, I was able to um, get the job uh, be able to finish my PhD here um, here soon. Chris, you're going to finish with me this year. And hopefully that allows me to transition into administration at the higher ed level as well. Cool. Thank you. Let's go with Michael Griffin. He's up in South Bend, Elkhart area. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Griffin. I am an academic advisor at Ivy Tech, South Bend, Elkhart. South Bend Elkhart campus. Um, how did I get here? Well, uh, I think I think really I got here through a, a series of vessels. Um, <clears throat> I started out in education as a teacher, elementary, middle, and then a uh, high school teacher, uh, with my last stop being at a uh, JAG specialist, teaching the JAG program at Elkhart Memorial High School. And then uh, I uh, saw a position open for 21st century scholars here at Ivy Tech. I was, I was able to, to, to get on here at that point and then just kind of transitioned over into uh, academic advising about two, two and a half, three years or so ago. Cool, 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 cool. Terrell. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Terrell Lynn. I am the owner and founder of Smile More Meal Prep and uh, also Smile More Catering. Uh, I left higher education in July of 2019. Uh, I was an admissions recruiter at the university and um, I got my start in just college in general, uh, Mr. Dows, uh, through a summer bridge program back in 2007. That uh, if you took two, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but if you took two courses and you got uh, good grades, then you could get admitted into the university. Um, and so if it wasn't for that program, I wouldn't be where I am today, which is in the last semester of my master's program. Uh, and then hopefully, if, if I feel like it, going for my PhD. Uh, but I, I still feel as though there is a future for me in higher ed. I just don't know uh, what that's going to look like. And currently, I'm just focusing on uh, my business is now, but I still do quite a bit with higher education, whether it's speaking engagements or uh, or con or consulting as well. So uh, that's kind of a little bit about me. I graduated uh, from PFW, and I'll have my master's degree at the end of this semester. 
cool. Congratulations on that, Terrell. And finally, Thomas Somerville. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Thomas Somerville. I am the Chief Operating Officer with Easter Seals Arc of Northeast Indiana. Uh, we serve individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We are the largest disability provider in Northeast Indiana. Um, I got my career start in higher education just um, through determination and perseverance, um, wanting better, wanting more education. So actually going to uh, IPFW is what it was called at that time for my undergrad and then pursuing my MBA, which I've completed. So um, that's kind of my story. Um, not that exciting. I don't plan on going to a PhD program. So kudos to all of my colleagues who are going through that. You know? So briefly talk about your experience when you were in college and how did you, you build resiliency to get to graduation? Because we know that just the mere fact of African-American males or black males getting into college is significant, but staying in graduation is, graduating is even more significant. And so speak briefly, and you can speak, whomever wants to speak can, 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 can answer this question, but talk about how did you build resiliency to overcome the obstacles that you may have experienced in, um, in, in, in when you were in college to get to graduation? Okay, I'll go. Um, I didn't want to be that guy, but I'll go. Um, so I, I'm actually from Fort Wayne, and I had the opportunity undergrad to go to an HBCU uh, in Norfolk, Virginia, Norfolk State. And so I didn't have as many challenges there. My issue was when I became a grad student at Penn State in um, State College, Pennsylvania. Uh, you're talking about an experience that, quite frankly, are two worlds apart. Uh, HBCU in Norfolk, Virginia, one in the spectrum. And uh, Penn State being on the other end of the spectrum, very rural area, very antiquated in its approach to, you know, politics, culture, all those things. And so um, there was no actual uh, professor on campus that helped me. It was one of my former professors from an HBCU. Her name is Dr. Sasha Johnson, um, who I would have those tough conversations with like, yo, these folks today or they somebody said this, another microaggression, another, you know, experience that's loaded in bias. And so... Um, it wasn't undergrad for me that was the challenge. It was grad school going to Penn State uh, where I got the support from an HBCU professor to, to be resilient, to keep pressing through. Not that I wanted to quit, but I, I had a space to channel my frustration and be blunt and honest with an individual outside of my experience that helped me manage my experience when it was time to go back to work or campus altogether. Uh, I, I can go next. Um, so for uh, so for me, um, I like I said, I got my start through the Summer Bridge program um, at PFW. Uh, undergrad was a bit different. I'm first generation uh, for my undergrad and and you know master's program. Um, there were quite a bit of challenges. It was nice having the Office of Diversity and Multicultural Affairs uh, because if I didn't have anywhere else to go, I had you know, people in that office I could lean on. I leaned on Dallas heavily, uh, as he, he'll probably tell you, because there are experiences that I had is, you know, I remember one experience and um, and I didn't know until I sat down and talked with Dallas because Dallas was frustrated about it. And I was like, hey, she gave me a compliment. What's the frustration? I, I had a music class. It was called Music for the Listener. And it was about classical music. And I, I'm a musician, so I, I love music. And I was doing really well in the class and I had an A and uh, uh, she pulled me out in the hallway and just like to tell me and, and two other black students, uh, only the black students got pulled in the hallway, uh, how we were meeting, you know, going above her expectations and, and uh, she didn't expect us to, you know, do as well and, and we're doing way better than she would have ever thought. And at first I was like, oh, okay, I'm killing it. I'm doing well in college and and I went and told Dallas and Dallas was like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, you know, she she was surprised because and then I went to a lot of my friends that were in that class. None of them had a one on one with her. None of them got told that. So the expectation of them was to do well. But the expectation of us was to not do well. And um, that's when I got a, a rude awakening of, you know, being on a PWI, predominantly white institution and 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 realizing that. 
there are people that are out there that, you know, because I talk the way that I talk and I am the way that I am, you know, I'm a little bit different. I'm not like, you know, other black people that may, that, you know, I grew up with that I call my kin. And, um, you know, if you do well and you're successful, then you can get accepted. And I had a lot of issues like that. Um, and I'm not going to take up too many, too much time, but a lot of the men on here could probably attest to a lot of these things, but it was having ODMA was great for me because I could go in there and I could figure out, man, like, Hey, help me read between the lines. Why are people accepting me the way that they are saying these little, uh, microaggressions or these things that are being said? Cause I was student body president for a couple of years at the university and I didn't see a lot of these things, but, uh, it also helped having people in my corner. And I, I praise Dallas a lot because he truly was that that uncle that just helped me throughout college. Because without him, I wouldn't have known a lot of the things that were going on or that were being being said. But that's just a little bit about me. I experienced quite a bit of frustration in my undergrad uh, at the at the university. Anyone else want to talk about? or add on to, to what Terrell has, uh, has shared, particularly about those microaggressions, because that's something that, you know, I remember experiencing that myself. Um, and particularly in high school, I remember that being said to me and I went home and shared that with my mom. And my mom was like livid, like you, you're not supposed to be articulate. You're not supposed to have, you know, um, ownership of the English language and know how to speak properly. Um, and so, you know, those things frustrated frustrated me. And so when I, I, I remember that moment with Terrell and, and there was another student too. And I, I, th I think we even went and walked over to the professor because I was looking for the professor. <laughs> we walked over to, to the actual building because I was going to have a conversation um, because those are some of the things that I think um, when we talk about stereotype threat and clock stills work around that and how we as African-American men when we walk into a room, there's a set of stereotypes that we're dealing that that we're dealing with that our other white compadres or or, or or Latino brothers don't have to deal with from society and from the media. So then to have a faculty member pull you out of class and then say as if you're this exceptional person when actually you're doing what you're supposed to do and obviously you're doing it well. And so I, I think we have to continue to be mindful and address those microaggressions when they happen. Um, because w one, it's inappropriate. And two, they need to understand what they're, what they're saying. And I know that the professor was well-meaning, um, but you also have to be mindful of in you being well-meaning, what else are you saying? What else is behind, is, is behind that? Um, what do you think are some of the things that keep um, African-American male students from enrolling into college? Um, I know at Ivy Tech, that's one of our lowest numbers. Um, at my previous institutions, it's always been low, um, lower numbers as far as, as, as looking at our overall enrollment. So what, what do you think from your own experiences are keeping us, our, our younger brothers from coming to college? I'll go ahead and uh, <clears throat> try to address this one. Uh, um, in my experience, I think that um, the ma vast majority of our guys, they're afraid, you know, um, whether that's being afraid of success or afraid of failure. So that's putting them in a, in a, in a serious conundrum here. So either that I'm going to succeed at something or I'm going to fail or you know what, I'm just not gonna try at all. You know, um, a lot of our, a lot of, a lot of our guys, they will, uh, if, if they don't have any representation, such as a, a, a Chris Douse or a Thomas Som Somerville, they don't feel like they can talk to anybody. So as opposed to, uh, you know, anyone else, non-minority, they have representation. And so, you know, that it kind of deters them from, from success or even attempting to, to uh, you know, go to college at all.
Uh, I can definitely uh, agree with that. I think um, it's, a, it's a lack of knowledge as well. Um, a lot of African-American males are first generation individuals who've gone to college. So they don't have a reference to go back to and say my mom or my dad did that. So the pathway may seem a lot more, um, a lot harder to get through, but I do think it's very important to have that connectivity once you get on campus, having like the Chris Dows, as I know when I was an undergrad, there was plenty of times I'd go to his office and be like, Dows, uh, what's going on? I need, I just need somebody to connect to. It may not even be on an educational standpoint, just on a social level, somebody that I can just go to and just let everything out on the table. And if you're in, if you feel like a small fish in a big pond going to college, I mean, it's important to have that connectivity to somebody that you can actually converse with and kind of get those things out. I know for me, being a, in undergrad, um, I have a bachelor's in communication science disorder, but also have a concentration in biology. And a lot of um, my biology courses, um, I was the only African-American male in those courses. And I remember talking to Dallas one time, um, we had this group project and everybody had to get into a group. And I'm not going to lie, I probably, <laughs> I probably contributed to the stereotype because I had an eight o'clock class I will come in when I had here I had my do-rag go on my sweatpants but at the end of the day that didn't define me I was one of the smartest people in the class but nobody wanted to be my partner because what they seen not knowing me or not getting to connect with me and I remember I told Dallas I'm like I, I, nobody wanted to be my partner <laughs> he was like oh that's all right don't worry about that don't worry about that but those feelings of isolation you know what I mean in that class I could have took that as I don't belong here. You know what I mean? This isn't the place for me. Um, I think that's a fear for a lot of African-American males as well. I would like to chime in from a K through 12 perspective, you know, being a former administrator, um, as well as a former teacher in Fort Wayne Community Schools. Um, I would say that students, Black students, Black male students particularly, are not empowered to go to the college level as well. I think when you're treated as a problem, when you're viewed as problematic, um, that spills over into perception of self. So if I'm viewed as a problem, if I'm viewed as a troublemaker, if I'm viewed as incapable, incompetent, unintelligent, those kinds of things, based off of my track record and my experience with education, inevitably that's going to impact how I view myself and what I'm capable of doing. So I, I would say that it's, it's multi-layered. Uh, now, obviously when you get there, the supports are, are great. But if, if I never see um, a Douse or Mr. Griffin or Mr. Somerville in my K-12 experience, you know, or somebody to say, you know, drown out all that noise, uh, you can do it, you're great. Um, I remember a true story. I remember when I was assistant principal at Northside, um, even the perception of what we, we can become, that was a young lady uh, who stayed, and I'm still in contact with her now today. Um, she stopped me like the first week of school and she said, um, what do you do here? I've seen you in the office with your shirt and tie. What do you do? And I was like, I'm an assistant principal. And she was like, not an assistant, like an actual assistant principal. And I said, yeah. And she about cut a step right there in the comments because she had never had a black administrator ever. This is a junior in high school. And so I became that resource for her. I was that word of encouragement. She lost her dad. I became a father figure. So those kinds of things that she never came across me uh, I remember she graduated early in large part because of the conversations we had. She had the capability and the, the wherewithal to do it. Um, so I think the K through 12 experience, there's no value on the black male as it should be for them to even be empowered to go meet you all at the college, well, meet us now, because I'm at the college level, but um, that, that, that doesn't happen in high school because historically we're viewed as problematic. I want to chime in to Mr. Griffin on that. Um, I agree with that. My first exposure to that connectivity, I was at Lane Middle School, and they had implemented this program called Lunch Talks. And it was an Afri it was a group of African American students, male students, and we had these two African American guys who would come and really just pour into us how important education was, how important connectivity was. And I will tell you that we had about 10 students that were in that lunch talk group. And I will say, I wanna say about like 75 to 80% of those students have graduated college, have you know gone on and done great things. So that foundation definitely set the tone because it definitely let me know that, hey, I'm worth college. You know, It always instilled in me from you know home, but having someone who's been there and done that 
really showed me that, hey, this is important for me and I can do the same thing as well. So I definitely agree with that. Yeah, I, I think the value of, of having those role models um, is significant. One of my role models was Charles Washington and he was the assistant director in the office. Um, it was multicultural services back in the day when I was going to, um, to IPFW. And, and he served as a big role model. He was the douse for me um, and was part of the reason of why I, I went into higher education, um, um, to be honest as well. Um, and, and as well as one of my other men mentors, the late Betty, G Betty um, Poignard. Um, but having someone who looks like you and, and, and who you can connect with, uh, is just critical. I, I think that's been critical to, to our success. Um, the one thing that I know about a couple of you, if you've been involved in your campus and Terrell was a student body president, um, I was a vice president um, at, at PFW, Thomas was involved in housing. Um, Khalid and Michael, were you involved as well on your campuses? Um, and how did you, you make that um, social integration piece. How did you do that when you were, were in school? Where are we talking, undergrad? Undergrad or graduate, it doesn't matter. Okay, uh, as far as undergrad, not really. I was highly involved with, uh, with my fraternity and a lot of the different things that we did uh, socially and then also with, within the community as well. So that helped out uh, tremendously for me. Um, I was involved, but, you know, going to an HBCU, I wouldn't necessarily say that I bridged the gap or challenged preconceived notions or misconceptions um, with, among the student body. I will say this, as uh, Terrell was telling his story, uh, and I'm, I'm going to throw it out there, and I'm sorry if this throws a wrench in your plans, uh, Brother Douse, but uh, I, I will say that uh, there were a couple situations, though, where I felt like I had to shape my professor's perceptions of the students they were serving too. And we're, we're talking about an HBCU um, where, so I, I felt like there was a mutual respect that students, we, that was the first time in my life where the idea of black, smart and cool, black and smart was cool. Uh, coming from Fort Wayne, that, that wasn't a norm for me. So there was an understanding among uh, who we were as students. Um, yes, uh, there we go. I see you Jackson State stand up. <laughs> um, but, but some of my professors, uh, two, two quick anecdotes. I remember my, my senior thesis, I was an English major. Uh, my professor who did not have me in class accused me of plagiarizing uh, because the paper was, was good. And she went to one of my other professors and he was like, no, like this is actually him. And well, another one of my professors was like, so are you going to Penn State? What's the plan? I was like, I want to be a superintendent. I want to be an administrator. And she said, those goals are kind of lofty, don't you think? And I was like, no, somebody got to do it. So I'm going to do it. Um, so th those were a couple of situations. There weren't a lot. But even with the adults, not necessarily students, but with the adults, I had to be like, nah, like, I'm, I'm capable. I'm called to do this. I, I'm not, I refuse just to make this a college experience and not do anything. That, that, that's big how you challenged her back when she challenged your goals. You know, as if, if the only goals we should aspire to should be lower level goals. And I think you hit something when you were talking about your student and she said, you're not an assistant. And, and just to share a little bit about Fort Wayne, most black folk who are in administrative positions, I'll say a, a good percentage, not most, but a good percentage um, are assistants. They're not assistant principals. They're not uh, a principal, they're assistants. And they have a lot of responsibility and have high contact with students. And so you would think that that would be a position where you would want someone who's educated and, and, and has some additional training to really impact. And so for this child to recognize that our student, um, that, that people who look like her are kind of in a subservient role and there's nothing wrong with doing that role um, is powerful for her to recognize the power differentiation between being a principal or an assistant principal and being an assistant. I think that's that that that's amazing. That that that's amazing. Um, and 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 uh, like I said, I'm not down in that role. My my people in my family have had that role in foreign community schools, but I, I think it shows where we are lacking um, other role models in higher administrative positions. 
um, and, and and how that needs to change. Um, did you feel like you were prepared when you went to college? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, man, they tell you all throughout school that when you're doing these assignments, and, and a lot of you could probably hear this from your teacher, oh, we're preparing you for college. Like, you know, when you go to college, you're going to have assignments that are due. When you go to college, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. I got to college, and it was nothing like high school uh, because you're an adult, one. And the freedom that that gives you, you have assignments and everything due, but I had never had a professor lay out my assignments and I have like most of the semester to get a lot of the things done. Like I didn't know um, when I got to college, I didn't know about credit card companies being on campus or, you know, credit cards or credit or any of that type of stuff. Um, when I thought I was going to college, I thought it was going to be the same type of thing. I wake up early in the morning. And I go to my classes and I'm in class all day. And they were like, oh, do you want to do Monday, Wednesday, and Friday or Tuesday, Thursdays? I'm like, wait, what? I don't have class every day? You know, like, and I wasn't prepared also uh, because I didn't know, I didn't know if I, I, I fought with this. Hey, Terrell, we lost you for a second. You're, you're still muted. Once I got the hang of it and built my team and my circle, it, it felt a lot better because Summer Bridge also helped with that because it brought in people from other places that didn't grow up in Fort Wayne that looked like me. And we were kind of like in this together. And a lot of us, that's what it was. Um, and once that was built, it made it a lot, it made it a lot better. For me, um, so there, there was the academic component, um, and, I, and I agree with various um, ideas that Terrell shared, but I guess I have to come back to being born and raised in Fort Wayne and then going to an area where it's, it's me, <laughs> you know, like my professors look like me, administrators look like me. And so, and, and I, must, I must have a head nod to, uh, give a head nod to William Cross's Nigrescence Theory. At the time, I didn't even know I was navigating and moving through that theory because coming from, uh, you know, relatively probably middle, lower class, you know, I knew I was going to college, you know, had an average GPA, but that affected the way I perceived other black folks. And so I had to be humbled a couple of times and, you know, just, just being real with y'all, like I had to a certain degree, uh, put myself on an intellectual pedestal and I had a small, uh, a very narrow focus on what I black, I thought black culture was. Um, for example, like I live Northeast, but all my homies and cousins and stuff live Southeast. So that's really just one aspect of the black experience. So I'm meeting people from Harlem and Cali and DC and they're all different. Um, and so I had a very narrow perspective on what blackness was and I didn't understand who I was as it, as it relates to being black in America until I went to an HBCU. So while the academic component where there were some adjustments, the, the majority of my adjustments happened within me uh, my identity, like I, I credit my years at Norfolk State for many aspects of the individual I became. It wasn't necessarily being raised in Fort Wayne and going to Penn State. It was being hit in the mouth a few times and being humble <laughs> about who I am in this country at an HBCU. All right, I'll jump in also. Uh, in my experience, you know, attending and graduating from, uh, in, my, in, my, in my personal opinion, the best HBCU around, you know, Jack State University, professor. <laughs> um, you know, I was prepared. I was prepared, you know, a couple from South Bend, Southeast Side, South Bend, crime ridden, uh, drug infested, uh, gang related, all of that stuff. That was my neighborhood. That's what we were basically known for, not a lot of great things other than uh, sports probably. So um, from an academic standpoint, I was already ready. I was involved in Upper Bound, uh, the Brit Summer Bridge program with Upper Bound um, and a lot of other, a lot of other things academic, from an academic standpoint. So I was ready to go, but once I got there, 
here comes the party life, here comes the fraternities, sororities, here comes anything else, anything else non-academic that you could probably imagine. And I caught all of them. Um, I wasn't strong enough to, to, well, I really wasn't strong enough to, to push it all away all at once. Um, I had some academic issues, you know, every other semester I sitting in front of the dean and I'm like, man, I'm not from this. I, I don't I don't act that way. So I had to clean myself up, get, get my act together as, uh, from academic. Uh, once I got it all together, I, I was able to succeed and then eventually graduate. So, um, but on that, on that end, um, I, I was ready, but from the, uh, the, the social aspect, I was not. Anyone else who wanted, wants to add on to that particular question? I would say um, from my perspective, I definitely was ready for college um, from a educational standpoint, as well as a cultural standpoint, because I felt like my parents really instilled in me um, a good foundation, understanding the amount of work I would have to put into uh, my education to excel. Um, I was always taught you may have to work a little harder than your counterparts. Just know that that's okay. Um, and that was always instilled in me. So I always had to drive to work hard and always finish what I started. So I knew once I started college, I was going to finish no matter what, you know, whatever I had to do, it was going to be a diploma in my hand at some point in time. So I will say my parents did a good job instilling that in me, but also I was really focused when I went to college as an undergrad um, because I wanted I mean, when you go to college, you know, they tell you, you want to make good money, you need to go to college, you need to get an education, you need to have a degree. So in my mind, that's the thing, like, yeah, I'm going to get out here, get this degree, start making all this money. So I made sure that I stay focused so I can do that. Um, but I will say the biggest thing from a cultural standpoint was my parents instilled in me that hard work will pay off at some point. You know, you may not see it right then and there, but it will pay off at some point. And so I just kept that in the forefront of my mind as I progressed through undergrad as well as graduate studies. I remember being relieved that there were extra credit opportunities in college. I remember teachers telling me, there's not going to be any extra credit when you get to college. And um, there was plenty. So I was like, okay, yeah, let's let's get some grade boosting happening. <laughs> Can we talk a little bit about, we talked a little bit about mentorship, but I, before I want to go into mentorship, I want to talk about this notion of imposter syndrome. Um, because that's big. And, and I want to know a little bit about, do you guys, did you feel like, like even now, do you feel like, hey, I'm an imposter? I mean, I know when I got into my PhD program, you know, and I'm a pretty smart kid, and, you know, I'm still sitting here thinking, should I really be writing this dissertation right now? Like, like is this really me? Have I really earned this right to be here um, writing writing this dissertation? Uh, and am I just faking the funk or do I really have something important to say? So let's talk a little bit about imposter syndrome and how that's impacted you um, or if it hasn't impacted you or how you've overcome um, that. And anyone can jump in. So I, that was, you know, from all of our conversations about Amanda, many of times I have called you like, I don't think I'm graduating. What's going on? You like throw your names on the thing. What are you talking about? I just don't, I feel like I'm going to get there and they're going to pull me behind the curtain and say, hey, uh, you're not supposed to be here. And I remember calling you before graduation, freaking out, like just, it's not going to happen. They're, they're wrong. It's not me that's supposed to graduate. I mean, I already got my cap and gown. Like I got everything. My name's been listed in the booklet. And, and I didn't know what imposter syndrome was until you broke it down for me. And you're like, that's just imposter syndrome. And I'm like, what, what's imposter syndrome? It's like, just like waiting for the other shoe to fall. Like you don't, 
you feel like a fraud and somebody's going to walk in at any moment and tell you that everything you've ever accomplished is not real. And then you're going to be like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> None of this stuff is real. And I struggle with that even now into my last semester, my master's program. Like I have, I think it's like a 3.92 GPA. Like I'm doing extremely well. I'm doing my businesses as well. And, and I'm just like, I don't feel, I don't feel like I'm supposed to, to be here. And even with my businesses doing what they're doing, I don't feel like I'm supposed to be here. And it's a, it's weird because, and this is going to be a weird take on imposter syndrome, but I feel like that imposter, but I also feel like imposter syndrome helps me to stay humble and it helps me to continue to do more because I feel like when I start slowing down or if I were to wake up and call you Dallas and say, yeah, I'm the man. Yeah, this imposter syndrome gone. Like, I feel like that's going to lead me down a path of destruction, which it did for a little bit of time. It led me down a path that, you know, we're not going to discuss on this call, but like it left me, led me down a path of destruction because I started thinking that I was somebody. And in that moment, I got a taste of what it's like to not have that imposter syndrome bothering me. And I did not like it at all. It made me feel as though I was better than who I am. And that's not how I was raised. So imposter syndrome, it also keeps me very humble. And I know that sounds weird because I, I should be happy of everything that I deserve. I'm running a company that within its first year did six figures. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen with many small businesses that start up. If I get off of this call, I'm probably going to text Dallas and be like, Dallas, oh my God, I just talked about my company making six figures. It's not me. No, Dallas, I didn't mean it. I shouldn't have said that. You know, but that's that imposter syndrome because everything you do in life, undergrad, a master's degree, business, whether you're running a business, whether you're in higher education, you always wake up and you look in the mirror and say, nah, that's not the real Terrell. Somebody about to knock on my door tomorrow and say, uh, sir, everything you ever accomplished was a lie. And I guarantee you, I'm going to be like, yeah, sounds about right. I was ready for you guys to show up. Let's go away. Put me in the cuffs. But it's it's been a very significant part of my life. And again, Dallas, you and I talk about this quite a bit, but that's just my take on it. It sucks. But at the same time, I don't want to see who I am. I've seen who I am without having that syndrome. And it, it's, it, it keeps me humble. Let's just, let's just say that. And I, I know I said a lot to say that it's imposter syndrome is real. It definitely is. I'd, I'd like to uh, address that if I can, Brother Dallas. Um, so my, my take is a little different from Terrell's and it's not about better or worse or right or wrong, um, but, but it's a little different. I, I don't think I suffered from uh, imposter syndrome. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with my upbringing. Again, you know, the mentors that I've had along the way, um, they, they empowered me and they allowed me to see my value. And so while I am confident in my abilities, I think there's a certain level of humility that I try to project and display and whatever I do. And I think that an assertiveness and assuredness in who I am, uh, there's a certain line of demarcation that I'm willing to draw on the sand as well too. When I, before I took this job, for example, um, you know, I wasn't worried about my performance and, and anything new. We think like, am I gonna fit in that kind of stuff, but not necessarily from a sense of like insecurity or devaluing whatever. Um, but before I took this job, my immediate supervisor, uh, the Dean of the College of Ed, he said, I, I owe it to tell you, there aren't a lot of people of color on campus. I said, man, look, that's been my reality. It is what it is. I'm not worried about that. But I owe it to tell you this, and I say this respectfully, don't just hire me for a brown face. I have abilities. I have a voice. I have talents that I need to offer. And if you can't embrace me for who I am and what I have to offer outside of, look who we have on campus. Nobody else has a Black professor in their department. I said, I'm not the person for you. So I wouldn't say that's me being pompous or arrogant. I think that's me being sure of who I am and what I have to offer. And so while I, I get the, you know, the disqualification element of what we're doing, and I think that ties back to my point earlier about K through 12, um, just the people that are imparting in us along the way that shape how we view ourselves. Um, I think ultimately for me, uh, I don't, there are other things that I do on the job, like learning when and how and why do I address this? Do I not address this? That microaggression that, you know, those kinds of things. I think that that's more about wisdom, but as far as my, my value and, and what I can offer, I wouldn't say that I'm struggling with that right now in my career. 
there's a question in the uh, queue um, in the chat from Tracy Davis that says, but where does it come from? Is this a thing that our white, count our Caucasian counterparts experience? If not, why? Um, and then Ruth Davis um, says, yes, although it does not come from the culture, but from internal messaging, at least for white women. And, and it's that internal messaging piece. Um, is it's big. It's big that, that you know, I, again, I experienced that myself um, and I know others. You just, it's something you struggle with at times because you know you've earned the right to be there. Thank you, Ruth, and thank you, Carrie. Joanne Alvarez, you had a question. Um, you want to ask your question? Yeah, I do. Um, so I work on campus as an advisor. A Latino student organization has become very multicultural. And so um, every semester when we're on campus, I may have one or two Black students. Um, but virtually, I have been struggling to connect with especially Black male students. And so I want a little bit of insight. Can you provide some of that, please? Can you say could you address your question yeah. again, please? Yes, please. Yes, yes, sorry. Um, okay, so um, I am the Director of Student Success and Engagement. And so with that, as the advisor to a student organization on campus, um, it is a Latino student organization that has become multicultural. And so I consider it success if I can pull one or two Black students to join our Latino student organization every semester. And I do pretty well when we are on campus face to face. However, as we've moved to this virtual environment, um, I am unable to pull particularly black male students to join us virtually. And so I would just like a little bit of insight or thoughts, something that maybe I haven't thought of, um, how I could do a better job connecting, reaching out engaging students to join us on a virtual platform. Terrell, you can go ahead and uh, <laughs> address that one. Listen, I, I think that one has so many, uh, so many elements in it because, and I don't, think, I don't think your question is wrong, it's a valid question. It's just, it's for me, it's different because there are so many different types of black males in this world. There are so many, like there's me where I may say, well, for me, it's a, it's a phone call, you know, to get me, you know, to explain to me the importance of the, the virtual uh, interaction and what it, what it could do to help me. But for somebody else, they could be going through something that's much bigger than a virtual you know, uh, joining a virtual group or jumping in a virtual group. I know guys that when we were in college, I was one of them that were trying to pay for bills for their mom and their kid, and, you know, and their and their nieces and nephews, you know, to make sure the water doesn't go out. And so it, it's it's definitely, it's, it's, it's weird because you never know what is going on in somebody's life. And I, to be completely honest, if I don't know something, I'm the first one to tell you, I, I don't know, and it's not that I, I can't, I can give you seven different things on that you can do for engagement, but it's all gonna come down to that to that person and what it is that motivates them to, to be involved because you're not the first to bring that up. I've got asked this question about uh, kids that are switched to virtually online and how a lot of the kids that aren't going to school uh, virtually have been kids that look like me, but I don't think that I'm well-versed and have enough knowledge to, to speak on something as as uh, as as far as like virtual in involvement, at least I don't think that think that I am. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, one thing I would suggest to make sure that the connectivity is multifaceted. I mean, let's not just use one source of connectivity with these individuals, because like Terrell said, you don't know the situations that are happening in those households. They may not have the resources to connect. So making sure that we're providing them an array of opportunities to connect with you, whether that's via phone, email, whatever the case may be. But we can't just rely on one source of connectivity because everybody may not have that resource to connect with you. I know for us, um, being that we run disability services, um, we have to make sure we connect with our stakeholders as well. And one of the things that we learned very quickly, everybody does not have internet access. 
or their data does not allow them to get on and be on a virtual meeting with us for an hour. So what other resources can we provide to them? What other connectivity connectivity aspects we can give to these families, these individuals, so they can connect, whether it's a phone call, whether it's an email, whether it's a drop by the house and say, hey, here's a resource. I mean, there's some families that we literally had to call and walk them through how to get on a Zoom. They may not know how to get on Zoom. They never had to do it. I mean, COVID has produced a, <laughs> a new world for everyone and we all had to adapt. So making sure that the connectivity is multifaceted so everyone can have the ability to connect with you. I do want to ask Joanne, um, what sort of uh, what sort of outlets have you utilized? Um, virtually, phone, email, uh, pretty much it. Zoom when maybe I go somewhere and announce or invite people to join. Um, okay. Have you tried Google Voice? No. So there's a text message feature with Google Voice that you, you, you can also utilize. Okay. Um, I, I know a lot of our advisors on my campus that they've been using it and it's, it works well. This is like a text well. feature? Mm-hmm. Okay. Text and call feature. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you You're all, welcome. very helpful. Working. Joanne, I also would say, um, if they're on social media, I mean, social media is a great way to connect mm -hmm. with your individuals as well. So Facebook has, mm -hmm. you know, real life interacting um, platform that you can connect with those individuals as well. So a lot of our individuals are on the social media. So use what they got. I mean, meet them where they're at. If they're using a social media platform, see if you can connect with them that way as well. And we did I, my last year, my last two years at the uh, at Purdue University, Fort Wayne, in admissions, we were calling thousands of students. We, a consultant came in and said, we need to call these students. And what we found out is we would call the students. Students don't want to be on, nowadays, they don't want to be on the phone. They won't answer the phone. Some of them won't even answer the phone for their own parents. They don't want to talk on the phone. I have employees that are 14 and 15. I have employees that are 20, 21. I'll, send, I'll give them a call and I'm their boss. I'll give them a call and they'll shoot me a text. Hey, sorry, I missed your call. What's up? I'm sitting there like, man, they do know I pay them. But then, you know, that's their preferred talking on the phone is awkward. But we grew up, when I grew up, it was, hey, what's up? You know, everybody talked, the voicemails were different. But we learned through these call campaigns that students will, we will sit there and call and leave voicemail to voicemail. And then we said, guys, we have a text app, text them. We would text them, got everything we needed right away because they're not going to, answer a number one that they don't know and they're not checking email that's evident at all and but texting was a way to go so like thomas said meeting them where they are and even if it's annoying to sign up for a system to do mass text with texting people i guarantee you'll get more of a response texting students than email or calling thank you yep. are there other questions um from uh the viewers who do you have any questions you want to ask our panel? No, Ann, I know All right, I had thanks. another um, a piece, maybe a suggestion. Um, sometimes we do, where I work, we do check-in calls with students. And one of the things we do is we, uh, or at least for me, I do a lot of calling. I call twice in a row. That way the student, if they see it once and they don't, they're like, okay, I'll dismiss it. And then they see that same call again that has worked a lot, just seeing that same number twice consecutively, that the, a lot of times they won't pick up the first time and they'll pick up the second time. It's like, oh yeah, I saw this number came up twice. I just wanted to answer it, you know, didn't know. So that could that could help. I don't, I don't just wanted to say that. Cool, thank you, Bryce. Other questions before I ask? I have one, Dallas. Huh? Okay, Karen. <laughs> um, so earlier when you guys were talking about some of the challenges that you uh, had um, when you were in higher ed and then some of the things that helped, you mentioned, you know, how, how detrimental and instrumental mentors were um, to your success and uh, to your drive. So, I mean, as, as white administrators, are there, I mean, are there tips or tricks or like 
anything that we can do, um, I mean, obviously having black mentors on campus is going to be preferable to, to push that additional drive, but like, what are some things that, what are some areas that, you know, white administrators, administrators can improve on to provide that level of like support for students? Um, forward? First thing, and I'll say this, I'm very adamant about this, but don't treat anyone differently. Don't treat a black person like a charity case. Don't give them extra help that you wouldn't give um, a white student. Um, there was a there was a mentor of mine in college, and Dallas knows him. His name was uh, Dr. McClellan. And throughout college, there was a there was a relationship that I had with him. It was weird because if you go to Dallas, Dallas treated you the same no matter what you looked like. Uh, if you were white and then you were in ODMA, like he treated you just like you would treat me. And that's what I, that's why I love Dallas. Uh, but, you know, this other mentor, you know, he had this soft spot for me. And it wasn't until I was getting ready to graduate that I realized that he did things for me that he didn't do for, for other people. And I'm not saying I'm not grateful or I'm, it's, I wasn't grateful for the things that he did, but it did make me feel as though, man, like I was, I was this charity case that he felt like he had to, and it could have been different. It could have been to him like, hey, I formed this great relationship and I go above and beyond for, for Terrell. But I noticed when a lot of the, you know, white workers that I would work with, it feels weird saying that, but uh, <laughs> when they would come and like help me, there was always some hidden agenda or there was a different intention of doing it. Like they were checking off some kind of box. And that's, if, if you're going to do it, do it from the bottom of your heart and do it and truly mean it when you do it and not just do it because that's what the world is saying that you need to do because people can sniff that out and they'll know. That's just my personal um, opinion on that. Yeah, I, I would like to build on Terrell's thought. I, I agree with everything he said. Uh, I'll be curious, Terrell, to pick your brain about equity and equality, though. That's a conversation for another day. But um, <laughs> as it relates to building relationships, I would, and I'm making a blanket statement here, but uh, for the most part, it's proven to be true based off my experience. I think Black people in general, we thrive on relationship building when we feel like we can trust you. Um, and, and I would say that's Black male, Black female. Um, you know, when, when you look at, um, what's, her, what's her name? Beverly Tatum's book, where all the Black kids sitting together in the cafeteria, that's very much rooted in this unspoken trust that we have a shared experience. Um, and there's nothing that I have to prove to you. There's a certain level of vulnerability that I'm willing to demonstrate because I trust you and this unspoken shared experience, which produces trust. Um, I, I think that when, like, like Terrell said, if, if this is not a box or a charity case, or you dealing with your own white guilt and not you specifically, but I'm pe speaking in a more general sense, I think that we can sniff that out. You're like, okay, you know, she, she may be the real deal. I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, you know, let my guard down. And, and over time, for me, it's been a lot easier to gradually trust an individual, but it takes time, it takes time. Thomas or Michael, you want to add to it? No, I agree with everything that they said. I think it's important for it to be genuine because uh, as I said, we can sniff that out. I think from a cultural standpoint, the university has to make a commitment to want to do something like this. This can't be just a uh, mass African-American students telling you what you need to do, but they need to see the value in having mentors on campus and the value that that brings to not only their university, but the students at their university. Because this is not just an African-American thing. Having African-American mentors on campus not only benefit African-Americans, but it benefits everybody on the campus. Mm -hmm. And that's the big thing to understand, that this is not just an African-American issue. This is a societal issue. This is bigger than just us. So recognizing that and understanding that we have to make strides to impact everybody, not just the African-American community, but everybody and understand our value and our worth with that. I totally agree with uh, everyone's statements. Um, just speaking on my prior experience as an educator in secondary, um, <clears throat> I was able to create long lasting relationships with pretty much parents and then students as well. Um, uh, Professor, uh, Professor G, you already know, it's difficult, very extremely difficult to reiterate, 
a great relationship with a parent, let alone a student, especially secondary ed. But um, it, it really speaks to um, the educator and then also the student um, in the respect that uh, you, you are willing to, to share a bit of your life, you know, while you're in school and then also your out of school experiences as well. Um, this creates the relationship, but you, you have to be serious about it. You have to be uh, consistent and you have to be honest about everything. And uh, just like Thomas said, you know, if you're not honest, if you're not sincere, you're not consistent, they, they'll definitely sniff you out and you'll, you, you won't have an impression. You can't make an impression. On so it's very important that you do that. And, and adding on what everyone is, has said, man, it, it's first off, it's very awesome to hear all of these perspectives and, you know, not feel alone in this sense. So gentlemen, like, thank you so much. But, you know, to add on what he was saying about everyone saying about being genuine, and that, I, I want to stress that point because one person can ruin it for a bunch of genuine people who truly want to be involved in a young black male's uh, education. Uh, you can take, it could take that one person who's checking the box or not being genuine, like for us to sniff it out and then going forward, it makes it 20 times harder for the next person who is genuine that would do, that does care and that wants, wants to help. So think about those types of things because we ask the questions about why do black males not, you know, don't go to college as much? Why are they not as, you know, involved as, as much? And it could be a simple story as, hey, I went there. This one person really like they they weren't they committed to me for just a little bit and they weren't consistent. And that's the word that he used consistent. It's like, oh, they helped me out on this one time and then I never saw them again. And then we start thinking in our heads, well, maybe that's what a lot of them are, are like. And I'm not saying it's right to think that, but I can understand someone's perspective of that when when they've been hurt or when they feel as though they've been wrong. So it's very important that we're consistent because if not, it's just going to ruin that for more people who could actually care about this person down the road. As you can see, I'm very passionate about, <laughs> about that, but all these perspectives have been awesome to hear. Pharrell, I, 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 oh, my fault, my fault. You, you sure you wanna go ahead? Yeah, just one, just one thing. Just oh one yeah, thing. <laughs> so I, I want to build on Terrell's thought again. Your 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 wonderful foundational thoughts you're putting out there, Terrell. Appreciate it. Uh, Carrie, one more thought for you. Uh, I would say assess the dynamics of the relationship. I think that, and I, again, I'm generalizing, and there are exceptions to every generalization. But when there the the relationship is transactional, that becomes problematic. Um, it, we're we're not looking for transactional relationships. We want. And when I say we, again, I'm generalizing. I don't want to get lost in, you know, stereotypes or blanket statements or absolutes. But when when it's about developing a relationship or connecting with us to assuage your own guilt or assuage your own, um, you know, remorse that you've done, to undo things that you've done in the past, it just pursue me for me because I'm valuable, because I'm worth it, because you believe in connecting with all of your students, not with the expectation that you receive something in return. Bryce, did you have something you want to add? Sure. I um, Terrell had mentioned, uh, I can't remember how he worded it, but something, something to the effect of sometimes like one person could ruin it for everybody. And I, I had to pull this term out of, you know, my brain um, figuratively. And um, I've heard the term corrective experience, you know, like, for example, like, I, I've, I've met a lot of good dogs, but there are times where I meet dogs where it's like, okay, I'm, I'm not sure I feel about your animal, but I know in my mind that, you know, I've, I've been around some really good dogs, but I, I think sometimes it's like, man, sometimes I just need a corrective experience because I'm not sure how I feel about animals. And sometimes I feel like that could be said the same uh, amongst a lot of the topics that we've, we've talked about where, you know, we've, we've been hurt in some way. And, you know, not to say that um, there wasn't good intention, but, you know, it can still affect us. Um, so that was just something that I thought of in general. Um, someone mentioned walls, and it just made me think of, of this quote. This is a loose quote, but I kind of scribbled it out. But it's like, oftentimes we put up walls not to keep people out, but to see who cares enough to remove them. So um, 
Yeah, I can't remember who mentioned that, but I was like, oh man, that's a good quote. Let me see if I can share mm -hmm. that with the, with the team. I like that. Thank you. Yeah. That's powerful. I like that. Well, we're about to, I, I want to one thank the panel um, for, for taking time out of your busy schedules um, to come and, and share your thoughts um, about black males in higher education and in that whole experience. Um, we've had a great conversation covering a variety of issues that have been powerful um, and very insightful. Um, I do want to highlight this issue of being genuine. I think that's important and key. Um, and there's two people um, um, who came in um, that I just want to give a shout out to. One is Rhonda Merriweather. Um, she has been at IPFW uh, since the 90s. Um, and she mm -hmm. has a powerhouse yes. advisor and director there. And she's been the douse or, or, or the mentor to all students there. And she needs to continue to be applauded for her hard work and staying in the fight and helping our students because she, she, she is the bellwether there. She has, she is critical and she, she's not going to say anything. She's probably blushing, but, <laughs> but, but Rhonda has been pivotal in my life, Joanne's life, Terrell's life, and any other student who's come through IPFW. And she's a giant um, in this work. And the other person is Travis Bloom. And, and Travis Bloom, AKA White Chocolate, was my uh, comrade um, when I started at IPFW. Um, he is a good friend, but he is a rising administrator. He's a vice president of student affairs and I'm not gonna mess up your campus name, Travis. You can jump in and say that because it's Baynock, I think is, is what it is. But, but, but Travis also has been committed to this work. And you wanna talk about someone who has been genuine about students of color graduating and, 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 and achieving their goals. This guy has been there for those students um, way before I started at IPFW and he was there after I started until he left and continued on in his career. And so genuine people such as Travis and Rhonda are, are just key and essential in making sure that people who are black males like me in the panel um, we, we get to where we want to get to in our lives. So I'm going to turn it back over to Carrie, and Carrie's going to close us out. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Douse. Um, so if you guys joined us um, and you're part of our Ivy Tech community, um, we are doing a drawing today for a $50 gift card for uh, Texas Roadhouse. Um, so uh, we want to do that as thanks for joining us live. And then we also have, uh, for anybody who is joining us by watching the video after uh, today, uh, that will also be available. And we're doing two additional drawings for two $25 gift certificates uh, to the brand's chocolates. So, um, so uh, any who don't win the $50 gift card uh, will be entered into that second drawing for the two $25 gift cards. So just making you all aware of that. But in order to do those drawings, I do need to know who all participated. And the way that we do that is um, I'm going to share this link here so that you can track your participation. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, so here you'll see a QR code um, and also a link here at the bottom, this link.ivytech.edu, join Barber Talks um, is the link. And then the QR code is that exact same link. So you can do one of those two things. You can put the link in the web browser or you can snap um, the QR code using your mobile device and it will link you up with our IV Life uh, webpage. And, um, and all you have to do is put in that link and then you should see something that looks a little bit like this. It's our Ivy Life page and it just says your, as long as you're signed in, it says your participation has been recorded. So um, there's a few staff members who are on here today who I recognized um, as RSVP. So I've already checked you as participated. So your, mo your note might say something like your participation has already been logged for this event and that's fine. That means we've already got you recorded. Um, but anybody else who, uh, who hasn't done that, you wanna go ahead and um, put in that link or, uh, do this QR code so that we can um, do your drawing. So um, we're going to give you guys a little bit of time to do that. And then I will email those, um, those winners out here. Uh, also, if you want to drop your email in the chat, just in case we don't have record of that, 
um, from your participation, you can do that as well, but I should be able to pull that information from the participation. That way we can get you sent your uh, gift certificate. So once again, I wanna thank uh, Mr. Douse for um, putting this program together. I think it is uh, very important information um, to share and uh, learning about that perspective. And, uh, and I wanna thank all of our panelists for being here and then all of our guests for joining us. So thanks again, and we hope to see you guys at future events.